whole place. I'm not sure where it's at, but um, let me share my screen and we'll shoot through this video. It's not that uh, TV show that they have with those Alaska linemen, is it? No, no, I wish I could have found one of those. Yeah. All right. You see me? Got it. All right. Being a lineman isn't only about stringing wires and climbing poles. It's about knowing what to do in an emergency situation in order to keep everyone safe. Power lines are everywhere. I just got a call saying a transformer fell off the pole laying on the ground. Yikes. Something missing from this poll. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Thanks for watching, guys. Don't forget to subscribe to Bob the Decline. And remember, always look up for the lines. Bam. I'm going to tell you something. That's, that hits on about everything you'll see as a lineman. Yeah. Um, I mean, this guy's moves from... A transformer missing on the pole. I, I don't think I've ever encountered one falling off the pole like that. Evidently, they didn't have it on the boats good. Um, he goes to, and I mean, when you get into a situation like this, there, there's more to just to than just um, that transformer falling off the pole. It's full of all. So I'm not sure which Santee Cup. I'm sure they do being a state entity. Um, there's all kind of stuff involved when you've got oil spill now you got to clean up and all kind of you know rules you got to follow far as regulations go reporting it and cleaning it up all those kinds of things um it can be a pain in the behind depending on where this thing hits the ground most of the time when you see something like that it's either after an accident car hits a pole or a major storm where you know, many poles are knocked over and then transformers are knocked off the pole, those kinds of things. So um, a lot more involved in just replacing the transformer it could be. Looks like maybe this one just kind of fell straight and landed on its uh, the bottom and it didn't create a, any kind of a hazard. I don't see no oil around the ground. Leave it right there for a second. Okay. I don't know if this is the perspective of the camera, the way it's looking at it, right there. but those brackets look yeah, all whopped up. Yeah, that top one, yeah. Yeah, the top one looks whopped up. It's bent completely out. Yeah. You see the bottom one's caved in, and then it kind of looks sideways too. So I don't know. I don't know what happened there. If something hit the pole that hard, you'd, you'd see it. But uh, that's something definitely going wrong here. And it could have been kind of like when Hurricane Hugo came through years ago and we had to replace thousands of transformers. And some of them we thought were good and the hangers were bent, so we tried to save them because 
we had such a shortage of transformers and ended up hanging wop side of transformers on the pole and and that mean that could have been a situation where they had to reuse an older transformer but I don't, i'm not really sure mm -hmm. uh, when uh, professor v is also talking about there about the oil spills you're obviously not going to be carrying a, a mini excavator around with your crew all day long uh, the biggest thing they taught us there at Santee Cooper was contain it. Yeah. You know, you don't, you don't really go into cleanup mode right away, but uh, you'll get some transformers that have a substantial amount of mineral oil inside of it. Right. Look out for ditches, you know, get a shovel and start blocking off a ditch if you can. If you see it, yeah. especially if you see a drain down there in the ground, uh, put something on top of it, cover it up with dirt, you know, yeah. barricade that stuff so it doesn't get in the rest of the water system. Then cleanup will come later. But uh, you let it get away from you, and especially if you're close to the ocean, yeah. or you're going to have a lot of people breathing down your neck. Oh, no. That can be a quite touchy situation. It can. Also, let's see if I can fast forward it. Three. Oh, I'm not sure what that is. They said something about the underground. He's talking about floods, yeah. I don't... yeah. Yeah, but then you're one of your other biggest contributors to outages during the winter and wind and rain are trees. Um, and what we, we had to go through some um, training, you know, chainsaw operations, those kinds of things, how to cut trees. Because, I mean, the tree crews just weren't readily available. They weren't on call like we were all the time. So... A lot of times you might have had to wait three or four or five hours, depending on who they could get a hold of and where they had to come from. So, I mean, I kind of I worked on the tree crew before, you know, went to the work for the power company. So I kind of knew how to cut trees off the line safely. And um, mm -hmm. there's a lot that goes into it. It's just not cut, cutting it off. It's sometimes you have to tie the conductors down to the back of the truck or um, I mean, I have seen guys cut this cut a tree off a line before it's pinned to the ground. He cut a three foot round and it was like holding the primary down in the party cut. And when, when he cut through it enough, the, of course the primary slung up and it slung that piece of wood up and it was dark. And we were kind of wondering where'd that thing go? And we were kind of scrambling a little bit, didn't know which way to go. So you have to be real careful when you're cutting those rounds off a mm -hmm. you know, wire up under tension laying on the ground. Yeah, I think the biggest safety aspect here, especially when you're working trouble call and storms or whatnot, is you come out to something like this and you've got to do the cutting on this, yeah. take your time. Exactly. Yeah, and uh, that was, you know, one of the lessons that they taught us regularly is uh, even if you have to take it off, you know, half a limb at a time, yeah. slowly cut it away, that weight comes yeah. off of it and your wire starts to raise back up and then get rid of the... Uh, you know, rest of the tree, but take it off piece by piece by piece. Even if it takes you a good amount of time, do not, and we got in trouble for this a couple of times, do not put a line truck on it. Yeah. Okay. A lot of people want to put a line truck on it, try to push it off. Tree limbs are going to break and where are they going to fall? Yep. They're right on your truck. So uh, take your time when cutting those trees up. Yep. Go ahead. Let me scroll through a little bit more. We got through the trees. Talking about car wrecks. I saw there was a couple car wrecks on here. Right here. There you go. There you go. You see a lot of that guys car run right through the pole. Left the primary neutron off floating. Um, that happens all the time. Um, just a dangerous situation. Because then you most of the time you've got to kill it, you know, and and really your instinct as a lineman is you don't want your customers without power, but when it comes to safety, the best thing to do is to, um, you want to float those primaries. So you want to kill it and then, or de-energize it and then remove that pole. And then if you can, if, if, if the primaries are floating high enough in there and you've got good clearance, you can re-energize it, get it back on. Yeah. So, I, I've seen some instances where, you know, it's been a fatality in the accident. Yeah. And the highway patrol does not want to seem disturbed. Right. That we've de-energized whole sections of line and just, you know, let it sit until they've completed their work. So try not to disturb the scene that much. And, you know, I like seeing pictures like this as far as that pole is concerned. Yeah. That'll yeah. give you a lot of perspective of how those top ties and how a pole can stand 
right even when it doesn't have the bottom section to it it's gone it's just flo- like you, professor v said it's just floating in the air yeah yeah and i have seen those those green poles somehow or another get struck by lightning or whatever and burn from the bottom to the top and it'll just be floating and it'll just be like a, a steady ember burning in it till it burns it up to the primary so um you'll run into that a lot let's see what else we got oh and one of is that another yeah that's, yep. that's nasty there on that one there's about five or six hours of work yeah yeah a lot of stuff to deal with this thing right here house fires guys you going on call you'll have to respond to these calls as well because if you've got a house or a building or structure that's on fire you can get it right there it's on fire and you've got power lines going to it and the, and the power's still hooked up you get, you're going to be the one to de-energize it they're not allowed to get close to this stuff so um you get i used to you know they they called me at home because most of the firemen in my area had my and they say hey you know i've got a, a house fire can you come and of course you know response time is pretty um you you got to respond pretty quick to those things those house fires so you, there's a lot of gruesome stuff you'll see out there not just with the accidents um i've been to many house fires where there's fatalities people burn up little children's burn up it's kind of a can be a kind of a gruesome scene but um you have to get in there and get out um, safely and then just kind of stand back. I mean, I've been blocked in by fire trucks for several hours and had to just sit there and wait on them and that's okay till you get paid by the hour. So yeah, dangerous situation. You know, I, I think w- when you're talking about that, I think when you hear and the dispatcher is gonna tell you, we've got a house fire at a certain location. Uh, you know, you need to get there quick because just like Professor V said, the fire department may do something like this you see they're spraying water from outside the road but they don't don't pull meters Mm -hmm. houses and the wire that's going to the house is eventually going to melt down and be hot on the ground yeah and your adrenaline's flowing and you're thinking i'm going to press that gas pedal a little bit harder to get there a little bit quicker don't do that right do the speed limit be safe okay for you and for others and remember you need to arrive alive Right. You need to get there. Otherwise, you're going to have to call somebody else out because you got in a wreck. So I, I know it happens. It's happened to me before. That adrenaline starts pumping. I got to get there fast. Get there safely is the uh, what you need to do. House yeah. fires are pretty common. Yeah. Yeah, this time of year, especially jumping back and forth between, uh, you know, the heat and the cold and all, that it, it just happens all the time. Just people, people try to... <laughs> Maybe put a heater in the closet, right, Professor Shoemaker? Do oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they do. Yeah. Yeah, or something to keep warm. So anyway, guys, that's, that's kind of where we're at with that. This video kind of gives a perspective of what it's like to be a lineman, be on call, um, the things you have to deal with out in the public. And really, in a lot of these situations, the public can be a hazard as well. So you want to keep everybody out of the way. You're you're pretty much in charge of the scene when you get to a broke pole or something because the highway patrol or law enforcement, EMS, those folks don't want to get near it because they don't know what they're dealing with. Mm-hmm. So anyway, yeah. anybody, anybody got any comments, questions, or concerns? Or I will, unless yeah. somebody else is going to jump in here. Yeah, I got a question. Sure, Cam. Um, how does the on call lot work? Like, you go to work normal hours, and then after that, if they need something, you, you go? Or uh, yeah, I'll, I'll fill that in as soon as I get done with the video. Here, that's a great question. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, okay, I like the way Professor Vermlin put it. When you get to scenes and situations, and it doesn't have to be, you know like a fire or a person related it covers the full scope of what's going out there in the electric world and you as beginning linemen go out there if you don't have anybody with you you still have control okay you don't have to approach the scene everything that's out in the electrical system has a specific number to it meters have a unique number poles <coughs> have a unique number transformers you ha- have a unique number 
and you're able to de-energize, de and they promoted this at Santa Cooper a good bit, that you're able to de-energize the entire system with a radio call. Right. So if you give a dispatcher, I'm bipolar, one, two, three, four, five, and I need this circuit dropped, they'll do it for you pretty quickly. Remember the top priority is the safety of you and the public. Now, are a good amount of people gonna be out of power? Yeah. Is your supervisor, when he gets there, gonna ask you, why did you drop the breaker or why did you drop that circuit? Maybe. What's your explanation gonna be? Safe. Safety. <laughs> okay. I've had my, it's not, don't get all concerned that somebody asked you the question that you're in trouble. As soon as you say, yeah, this line was down on the ground, 7,200 volts, it was burning. I felt it was unsafe for both us, crew-wise, and the public. You're scot-free. I've, I've dropped, well, I'll give that transmission story a little. I've dropped the whole substation at one time. <clears throat> Why? Boss man called me up. What's the situation? Why did you drop the substation? He didn't sound mad or mean. I just said, hey, bad for the public. We had a fire going on inside the substation. Didn't want to cause any further damage. Thank you very much. I'll relay it on to the... Uh, rest of the administration, president and everybody, because they're gonna be asking questions. News is gonna be calling you, yeah. the company. Okay, any other questions there? All right, on-call status. And Professor V, you can, yours is a different little situation, so I'll, because you were all by yourself, so I'll let it go both sides here. You're gonna be assigned to a crew, okay? And your crew, and I'll just give this for an example, I had five Santee Cooper crews working in Myrtle Beach. So once every four weeks, you're the fifth crew. Once every four weeks, you are on call status 24 seven for one full week, Wednesday to Wednesday, all right? On that crew, you had a first response person. So the first response person was obviously the first responder. He would get the call for the problem. If it was simple, he would fix it. If he needed more help, he would call the rest of the crew in to help him out, either one, two, three. He just made that decision off the, whatever the need was out there in the field. So that, that's the process that it, that it took. Now, we'll stay on this for a little bit because it's good information. You're only, by OSHA rules, you're only allowed to work 16 hours straight. What do I, what I mean by that? Gotta have sleep in the middle, got thing. Yeah, you can only work 16 consecutive hours. Now, I want to talk safety. We're, we're still in the safety part on it. If I work for 12 hours, go home for an hour and get called back out, have I worked 16 hours straight? No. And obviously, you haven't. Guys, this is where the safety part comes in. If you're working that 12 hours and you're in your 13th, 14th, and 15th hour, even with that hour break, and you don't feel you feel tired and you're getting tired, let your supervisor know, okay? <laughs> let your supervisor know, hey, I'm not, you know, I've been on call for four days. I've been called out every night. I'm in my 15th hour. I need some rest. Let them know. He'll call somebody else that's not on call. He'll round somebody up. You'd go home and get some sleep, okay? We didn't scold anybody for not working that 16 hours straight is what I'm trying to get at. You gauge yourself that if you're sitting there in a truck and uh, you're having to ask that somebody else to drive and you're falling asleep in the truck, you need to go home and get some rest. How about the rest part, Robbie? That's right. Anytime, anytime you get to that 16 hour mark with Duke, I mean, they, they cut it off right then and there that, and they send you home and you get, you got to have eight hours of off time before you can come back. So, um, and really to me, we work 10 hour days, so they add, they bumped us up to 10 hours off, but the rule is eight hours. But I mean, it's just, if, you, if you're not able to get out there and get it, you know, do your job safely, then you need to call like Professor Schumacher said, call your supervisor, let him know, hey, I gotta go home and get some rest. He's not gonna say, no, you got to stay at work. Mm -hmm. um, you know, go home, get your rest, and then if there's, work, you know, back to be done and you come back to work. But I mean, on call, as far as Duke goes, I, my situation was a little bit different because I was a distribution <laughs> service rep. I was on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's, 
that's that's how I roll down in my area. 365, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for the past 18 years, I was on call every day. Um, now, if I wanted to go somewhere or go on vacation, leave town, there's a crew in King Street. There was a man on call over that way. He would take my call for me or I'd call somebody else if it was like storm season and get them to pick my call up for the time I was going to be gone. But it was my responsibility to make sure it was covered while I was out of there. And then sometimes, even though, you know, I, I, I was gone off maybe over the beach or Florence or Charleston or whatever, and we had a really bad thunderstorm, I had to drop what I was doing and come back because, because of the amount of work that had to be done to get the power back on. So, I mean, just because you're off don't mean that you're really off sometimes. You know, yeah, they had uh, severity levels for Santee Cooper, especially if you had a major storm coming. Yeah. Uh, we'll say like a hurricane was coming to the coast. Usually 48 hours before that, you'd get notification that everybody was on call. Right. So if you had planned a trip to Colorado, yeah. it was over. Right. Yeah, you were not on. Everybody had to be on call and you had to stay in your area. Yeah. <laughs> as yeah. far as how much do you get paid when you're working overtime? time and a half time and a half okay some companies are actually doing double time right uh some contractors have contracts to work for utilities and i think duke duke did this for a while i'm not sure if they're doing that in one area in north carolina uh duke crews did not respond to trouble calls contract crews did okay Correct. and contract crews on their contract says well if we were working overtime for you guys they had the first responders and everything uh they were paid double time Right. That's one nice wallet benefit to it. The other thing is experience, guys. You will get no better rounded experience on all types of situations until you've worked a storm or you've worked out on trouble calls and overtime. Right. So I, I know you think right now, well, I'm just a beginning lineman. I won't do, know anything to do out there. If they have called you in, they need you. Even if you're grunting for somebody or making up material, whatever, yeah. eventually you're going to get in there. And who notices it? Who recognizes it? The boss and the other crew. The guy. boss man, sure. Okay, the boss man. And, uh, you know, I, I put merit into an employee. You can trade call with somebody else. So if I'm on this week and I really want to go downtown, I, I could trade. Let's do Cameron and Santarella. You're both line technician C's. Hey, Santarella, can you take my call this week and I'll take yours next week? That's all fine and dandy. You have to stay at the same level, C to C, B to B, or A to A. Okay. You can have a A, a C to A lineman's place because that's just not legal and you can see why. But you can trade. Here's the other thing that's going on. Timothy Thomas is here and he's on call for a week. Then uh, he lives close to the service center and the next week he's not on call. I'm going to call. I've got all my crew, I need more people. I'm going to call Timothy Thomas. It, it's good, even though you're not on call, to respond. Okay? And that's going in my black book. You know, wasn't on call, responded anyway. Yeah. And I, uh, what do you think, Professor V? It is. And, and one thing we kind of like to do, because I, I assisted the King Street crew, it's just like maybe holidays, long weekends, or whatever. We all kind of communicated, hey, who's going to be around the weekend just in case we had trouble. Mm -hmm. Just communicate with each other. Hey, I know so-and-so's out of town. I know this guy's going to be in and out. So, you know, um, you really didn't want to bother the guy that just came off a call, but if it was bad enough, he's going to have to come anyway. But you want to communicate round about everybody that who's going to be there, who's not, who can assist. Um, very important part of the job is that communication. Okay. Also be prepared for storms that are not in your state. Yep. Uh, I've been to plenty of states on storm storm calls. It's it's tough. It, yeah. It's not. We lived in a tractor trailer for a week <laughs> that, that had cots in it. It was not pretty. And you know how I am. Yeah. And I was kind enough to step outside a couple hundred times. But yeah, uh, you know, be prepared to that. Be prepared to travel out of state. Now, the money's good again, but you got to follow those same rules. All that, all that bad weather that's going up up north around, you know, West Virginia, 
Pennsylvania, New York, and those places right now, I guarantee you there's crews up and down the highway right now going to assist with that trouble. Right. Okay, any other any other questions on that? That was a good question to go. It was a good opportunity and time to explain. There's more to it, obviously, yeah. but you explain the top level stuff that's going out there. I mean, I can guarantee you when I, my paycheck came, it, it was a pretty sight. Yes. But the payoff was long term is Shoemaker has come in 12 times this month to respond to trouble calls. And that's how you get good evaluations. That's how you get promotions. <laughs> And the internal stuff that's going in your brain. Once you've done a poll change out four or five times in a month, guess what? You're getting good at it. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions there? That was kind of lengthy. That's 9 30. Let's take 10. Let's do it. And they called it an ITR initial um, time response. And you had to be in that window to respond or else then you you had so many times if you missed that 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 window of time then you know then you were held accountable for it whether with your your raise or with your you know evaluation or whatever so each company does it different ways yeah i mean we're going to use some common sense there you know if uh you live in conway and you need to report to myrtle beach uh the way that it's done you're going to get your interview. You're going to get your uh, skill set test. Then they're going to start drilling down a little bit closer. And what we used at Santee Cooper was Google Maps. And we throw your address location in there. We throw the location address of the service center that you went to. And they would do an estimate of time on that. Now, what they did not include was traffic lights. Right. And traffic. That all comes in uh, automatic. So that's going to be a non-traffic light situation with no traffic on it. And if that time said 30 minutes, guess what? You were fine. Now, what happens when you're driving in on a normal day, especially in the summertime from Conway to Myrtle Beach? Traffic lights and what else? Traffic. Traffic. Have yeah. you ever driven down 501 on July 4th? Woo! Or 544? Yeah, good luck. Good luck with that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's good for you to, you know, either text or, you know, send, call your supervisor, say, hey, I'm stuck in traffic. But that is not considered in the hiring process for us, at least. OK, I had, I had a question. Yes, sir. Uh, do they uh, let you take a company vehicle home for when you're on call? If you're a first response responder or supervisor. If you are not one of those, don't qualify for one of those, you're driving your own vehicle. So you just drive it to the shop and take the uh, truck, the work yeah, truck? Take whatever, you know, grab whatever yeah. they need as far as, you know, what they're asking for. Good question. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Is there any, like, compensation for you having to drive your own truck or, like, you know? Uh, just... We used to, and we quit that, and I'll, I'll tell you how we quit that. Uh, Professor V, how about now for Duke? Duke does not. Well, if you live, I think it's over maybe 30 minutes away, you can get mileage, you know, to the location and back. But most of the time, it's, it's out of your pocket. Okay. and and But there is compensation for it as far as that's concerned. And really, I'm not going to do all the math that's involved in it. Each individual call that you get, you get paid two and a half hours minimum. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So if, I, if I get called to Myrtle Beach and work for one hour, you're going to get a minimum of two and a half hours. Yeah. Duke, Duke's a little bit different than that. We got off at five in the afternoon from five o'clock till 10 o'clock was a two hour call out from 10 o'clock to like six o'clock in the morning when we reported it was a three hour call out. So that, that takes care of your fuel and actually is pretty generous. Yeah. If, if you ask me. If I could add something real quick, uh, one of my one of my good friends, well, my uncle basically, he got called in like three thirty the other morning, and didn't get off until like eleven thirty that next morning. Yeah, we'll get in deeper. I, I know we're going to get into class here in just a minute. We'll get a little bit deeper in that. Our normal working hours. We're seven to three thirty at Santee Cooper. So if you get called in at three thirty, 
you're only going to get three and a half hours overtime. Like 3.30 a.m.? Right. Oh, okay. okay. Because you now you work 3.30 to 7, and once you hit that 7 o'clock time, now you're working normal working hours. Right. right. Okay. It can, right. Get it can get complicated, but we'll get into that further later on. Yep. Okay. Any other questions about overtime? Just, you know, you heard me. Be prepared to be, especially if you're on the on-call crew, be prepared for that. If you see a storm coming or you get notification, be prepared for that as far as your personal lives are concerned. And even when you're not on call, just, y'all heard me, right? Yeah. yeah. All right, good, good to go. All right, let's rock and roll. I'm on page 204 of the, uh, of the book. And it talks about current transformers. Now, simply, just by the word of what I called it, a current transformer, what does a current transformer do? Transforms current. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. It transforms current. So I've got a video for you. Excuse me. Uh, what page was that again? 204. Now see that share. You guys see a share there? Got it. Okay, thank you. Well, hello YouTube. And today I'm gonna to talk about these little beauties. What are they? They are current transformers. I'm going to tell you a little about how they work and what kind of things you can do with them. Stand by. All right. Now, how does a current transformer or a CT work? Well, it works kind of like a regular transformer works. This is a voltage transformer, but it takes voltage in, which is 120 or 240, and converts it to either a 12 volts if you connect them in parallel or 24 volts if you connect them in series and it doesn't start pulling current until you hook it up to a load now a current transformer it picks up the magnetic field from the wire no current flowing through the wire there is no current flowing out of the current transformer so how do you measure how many amps is coming out of the CT? Do you stick an amp meter across there? Well, no, actually what you do is you put a resistor across there. Or in this case, you put it across these wires. And what will that, what will that do? Well, just like Ohm's Law tells us it'll do, if you have a short circuit, you're not going to have any voltage coming through there. It'll be all current. But if you put a resistor across there, you now have a voltage built up across that resistor that can be measured. Situations call for different uh, sized resistors. Generally, they go anywhere from 25 ohms to about 200 ohms. All depends on what you're doing. I'll show you how to set that up and measure it a little bit later. Now CTs can come in all kinds of different shapes and sizes. The smaller the CT, the, the CT, do you stick an amp? Okay. Uh, hold on, I want the rest of this picture right here. Wire, there is no current flowing out of the current transformer. So how do you measure how many amps? Okay, so the purpose of a current transformer, first we know it transforms current. Uh, you see the numbers that are on the top there? What are they? 200. 205. What? So it's a 200 to five. Right. It's a 200 to 5 ratio. So if I put 200 amps, or if 200 amps travels through the donut, or that CT through wire that I've got through there, my output amperage is going to be what? 5. 5, correct. 
If 100 amps flows through the conductor that's inside the CT, how much amperage am I going to get out? 2.5. 2.5. Okay, so now you know the principle of how it's converting uh, amperage into a lower amperage. I, I, this, I, there's not much more in this video. It goes in deeper into the properties and the fields and all like that. Now, I did say at the beginning there, what is it measuring? Is it, me is it an amp meter? No, it's not an amp meter, but it is measuring the amount of elect the uh, magnetic field that's running there. It, it's closely in properties to doing that. It's just doing that all the time. All right, so we've got a 200 to five current transformer. Now we're, I'm gonna show you why we use current transformers. There's two purposes and we wanna write these down. One is for metering. So I'm able to meter high currents and one is for measuring. So I'm gonna take a measurement of a high current and use that in as far as relaying or sending information to other equipment. Metering purpose and measuring purpose. The um, CT does not change, all right? C transforms current all the time, but it has two different purposes. And I'll show you a picture here in just a moment as soon as I get over here. Nope. Okay, that's my transformer. Okay, so this is a typical low amperage. This is a 400 amp three phase meter base. All right, so you'll see how tight the compartment is here. The three lugs that you see on top here in, in the center, the left, center, and right. Those are where all your energized cables come in. Like I said, it's three phase, and then your neutral goes over here. But you'll see by the compartment size, how many wires can I put in here and wire sizes? Not very big, correct? All right, there's not much space in here. So I'm not able to really do any measurements on high amounts of uh, amperage that are coming in here. It's gonna be a lower amount. And then I've got my meter that sits in here and this goes out to the customer to whatever it's going to inside a building or whatever. Now take a look at this transformer and I'll zoom in here a little bit. So this is a three phase pad mount transformer for one customer. And these are the wires that are going into the customer. Now, do you remember the meter base? Can I fit all of those conductors inside of a meter base? No. Absolutely not, okay. So what do I need to use in this situation to be able to meter the amperage that's coming out of all these conductors? What am I gonna use? A resistor? A what? A resistor? No, what are we talking about? A current transformer. A current transformer, right. Now I can use multiple or singular current transformers, put the, put the wires through it, and I can transform that amperage and send it to one meter. So this is a transformer that's feeding one business. Obviously, all of the conductors are not going to fit inside a meter base, which I just showed you. So now I'm going to have to use a CT to transform those amperages to a lower value so I can send them to a meter. Typically the meter sits right on the transformer that's being metered. So that's one purpose of a current transformer. That's the uh, metering part of it. The other part uh, is, and I'll bring up a new picture here. Substation, and we did this just a little bit ago, circuit breaker. Let's go to images. And here's a perfect one to use. Pull up the image and read tab. Bang. Hmm. Okay, so this is a substation circuit breaker. Uh, Professor V spoke about this before. How do I know it's a circuit breaker and not a transformer?
Look at your bushing sizes. Is this bushing the same size as this? On both sides. Right, right. So there's no transformation coming in here. I've got a voltage that's coming in and I've got the same voltage that's going out. Okay. Now, there's going to be high amperage in these. Do I want to put a high amperage and that amount of conductor into this panel and be able to get measurements off of it? Or do I want to reduce that so I'm able to use it inside this panel? The first was the measuring part. Now I'm going to the metering, excuse me, metering part. Now I'm going to the measuring part. I do not want to, especially when I start using electronics in here that use lower voltages, lower amperages. I don't want to use the entire amperage amount in here. I want it transformed to be a lower amount to be able to go in this panel and use the sensitive equipment. So what do I use to transform the current? The current transformer. The current transformer again, okay. I'll, I'll take a, uh, a wild guess here. In looking at this circuit breaker right here, where do you think the, trans the uh, current transformers are located? Directly on top of those bushings. Take another guess. You're you're close. Go completely opposite direction. On the bottom of them. There you go. You see these silver rings. Uh, right. These silver rings are housing the CT inside of it, so it's measuring the current, transforming it both in and out. Right. They got to match each other. That that's that'll let you know if you've got breaker failure or a problem inside the breaker. So they're taking it and they're transforming it both in and out, taking that lower amperage and going into the control panel to use for relays and sensitive equipment. So that's the purpose of a CT. Now it's used in other locations, especially in a substation like a, the substation transformer or whatnot. That's a really expensive piece of equipment, but that's the purpose of the CT in the, in the break right here. Now I have a fault on the conductor What's it going to do to the amperage? A lightning strikes it. What's it going to do to the amperage in here? Uh, decrease. A lightning strike? When you raise the voltage, it decreases amps? A lightning strike. It's DC. That's a line fault. Uh, okay. it's going to this is a lightning strike. Yeah, you're going to get a major increase in the amount of amperage that's transformed comes into this panel and there are settings that are going on the panel once and we'll use the 200 to five. Say uh, it goes, we'll use the 200 to five value. Say it's rated at 800 amps on the conductor. Well, that would translate to what? A 20 amp reading in here. If that 20 amp reading goes to 25 because it's gone over the rating, it's gonna trip open the breaker. So that's the mechanism. I cannot introduce 800 amps into this panel. It's just not electrically sound and safe. I've got to transform it somehow. But still in the ratio reading, if I go over the ratio amount that's preset in the breaker, it's gonna trip the breaker open. It's gonna say, nope, that's too high. I need you to trip open. So is there any questions on the purpose of a current transformer? What are the two uses? Uh, it's a meter, meter, and measure. Measure. Meter. meter and measure, right? The meter was for the transformer. So we're able to meter high loads, high currents. And the measure was to measure high loads and high currents, transform them to use in relay equipment. There we go. All right, so I'm just gonna leave it right there. Uh, Professor B. Yes. Did you do your own, as far as the installation, it, you know, secondary and transport. Did you do CT installations? Do you have a department that did that? We had a metering department did that. Normally, they the, the only thing they had were vans to go around, but we would go out and help them. They would give us the stuff and we would install it for them. Okay, okay. All right, same with Santee Cooper. They had a meter and measure, I mean, excuse me, a meter department that uh, did that for you, but that does not negate that they're, I mean, they can't get up in a bucket truck. Yeah, uh, they're not going to do the install and removal of them. You're going to do that in conjunction with them. 
Okay. Now there's something uh, the other day we kind of left out when we were talking about the uh, clamp on amp meter that I do want to go over. We, we caught on it partially, but uh, I do want to in include this also. All right, you should see a new paint screen. Yeah. Okay. All right, so we talked about the uh, other day of that when we use a clamp on meter, how many conductors are we supposed to go around? So this is coming off my transformer. I've got a neutral wire, got a 120 wire, and I got another 120 volt wire. All right, obviously we know with the voltmeter to check voltage, I go from this point to this point and I should read 120 volts. I go to the, from this point to this point with my leads, I'm gonna get 120 volts. And I go from this point to this point, I should read what? 240. 240 volts, that's with my voltmeter, okay? With an amp meter, how many conductors am I supposed to put the clamp, the clamp, the amp meter on to be able to get an amp reading? One. Can I clamp it around all three conductors at one time? And get no. Good, good amp reading. No. Why not? <clears throat> the clamp won't fit or you'll get a wrong reading. The clamp will fit, but you will get a wrong reading. Why are you going to get a wrong reading? Because you're measuring the amps from all three of those lines instead of just one line. Let's well, say I want to get the full amperage to say this goes to my house. And I'm going to get the total amperage that goes in the house. Can I clamp around all three at one time? Yes. Okay. I, would, I mean, uh, I think that was Santorella. Santorella was getting on the right scope right here. It's recommended that if you want to get the reading going into the house at one time, you can use the two hot wires. All right. Which direction is current flow going? Towards the house. Towards the house. Yeah. Through the two energized conductors. All right, through the two energized conductors. Now here's what happens, and I will get, well, let's just say a number, 25 amps. That's the total of both conductors at one time. If I take the clamp off, usually I'm gonna get 12 and a half, 12 and a half, if I do them individually. What you cannot do, and Santorella was headed this direction, is if I have, and this is the property of, of electricity here, if I have 10 amps on this conductor and 12 amps, and this is just by what's being used on the house, and I clamp around both hots at one time, I'm going to get a total of 22 amps. That is good. If I clamp around all three at one time, I'm gonna get 22 minus two. Where am I getting this minus two from? I meant the neutral line. Right, and why? What direction are these flowing? Towards the house. All right, are these yeah. two loads, what they call imbalanced? Are they in imbalanced, I-M-B-A, are they out of balance? Yes, they're not balanced. By how much? Two amps. Two amps. That imbalance of two amps flows the neutral in the opposite direction. So I'm going to get 22 in on the two hot legs, two out. The meter's going to read 20. Is that correct? No. No, because you have an inbound of 22. So you're going to get an incorrect reading on the amp meter, okay? Do remember, never include 
the neutral wire inside the amp meter if you're measuring others with it. Now, can I take the amp meter off and actually put it around the neutral and get a reading by itself? Yes. <laughs> yes, you can. How much will yeah. it be? The backflow amount of two. The backflow amount, right? exactly, two amps, okay? That will read for you, but we never, until we get into substation work, we don't really need to know what the full amperage is going into the house. I mean, excuse me, coming out. We're just gonna to need to know these two variables right here when we're doing measurements, the two hot wires. Okay, does everybody understand that? Never clamp around the two. Now here's, I'll bring up another picture here. Oh, let's shrink this down. Fifteen KV BRD uh -huh. cable. I'll show you some images here. Now this is underground primary cable. We're going to take a look at here. And we'll just bring up that little picture. Looks pretty good. Pretty small, but pretty good. So the inner core conductor right here that you see the silver part, that's the actual primary voltage, the conductor, insulation. Then you've got a jacket shield here, ground. Then you have an outer jacket right here that protects everything. Can I clamp an amp meter around a primary cable and get a true reading? No. Why not? No. Why not? Impedance. Yeah. Impedance? I'm mean, oh. measuring amperage, not voltage. This one you get it. Your no answer is correct. You're not going to get a true reading of the amperage that's on the conductor. Um, dig a little bit here. Why? Conductor, insulation, neutral, ground. Because your neutral is in between your primary? There you go. All right. You're going to have current flow that's going one direction on the conductor. On ground, where is that flowing to? No. The opposite direction. There you go. So you're not going to be ever to clamp on a clamp on amp meter around an underground primary cable and get a true reading on the amperage that's flowing through it. It's just not possible. Okay. What time are we holding there, Professor V? Uh, 10-11. Okay, well, a couple more minutes here. All right, so we have completed that. I did want to, that was not in the course of today, but I do want to include that as far as clamp on amp meters is concerned and what conductors you can put it around to get a true reading on an amp meter. Okay, so I'm going to move through the rest of meters. We will get more meters later on. And I have moved up to page 240, and I'm in unit nine, alternating current. Okay, luckily we've touched on this before. We've had some talks about it. And I'm just gonna read you the bottom of the page. Probably the single greatest advantage of alternating current is the fact that AC current can be transformed and DC current cannot. We've already discussed that before. And without transformation, can we have an electrical utility network? Mm -hmm. When we leave, no. when, you're, when you're with your presentations, you, you generated at the station, and what's the first thing you did once it left outside the station? What was the next piece? That's the step down. Incorrect. Step up, transformers. Step up. Switch. Step up. Okay. Obviously, at my generating station. It is gonna be extremely difficult for me to insulate and be safe in a generating station if I generated at 230,000 volts. The cost would be enormous. It'd be very unsafe, unsafe to have 230 kV in a generator. So what I'll need to do, and I think the highest that I have seen in the environment, I can insulate up to 34.5 kV, that's manageable, Mm -hmm. take it out of the station and then step up that voltage to 230,000 volts. 
All right, I've stepped it up to 230 kV. I can transmit it longer distances with smaller conductors. I come to the substation, then what do I do, Santarella? Step down. Step it down, okay? That's easier to distribute out to my towns and cities. Without transformation, electric utilities would not exist. And that's, you can only do transformation with the AC alternating current. Voltage can be stepped up from the purpose of transmission and the step back down when it is used by some device. Transmission voltages of 69 kV, 138 kV, and 345 kV are common, I agree. And there are some in between. The advantage of high voltage transmission is that less current is required to produce the same amount of power. I raise my voltage, I lower my amperage, but power remains the same. Remember Ohm's law. The reduction of current permits a smaller wires to be used, which results in a savings of material. And when they say, they kind of leave it out there, you know, a savings of material is kind of nonchalant. I mean, millions of dollars in savings of material. Okay. So we'll jump over to, I'm now on the bottom of page 9-6. Sine waves. The most common of all AC waveforms is the sine wave. They are produced by all rotating machines. What does a generating station, what does a generator to do? Does it rotate? Yes, it rotates a magnet. All right. We'll get into that in just a moment. That's coming up. The sine wave contains a total of 360 electrical degrees. So one full rotation of a generator and one full sine wave are the same, 360 degrees of rotation. It reaches its peak positive voltage at 90 degrees, returns to a value of zero volts at 180, and increases to its maximum negative voltage at 270. Now remember, they're not saying a negative, like we do in DC, negative is ground. Negative is actually a voltage and there is actually a peak voltage on the positive 90 degree value. So I think I've got you a, that's, no, no, no turbine, no substation, no. So I'll run back to the turbine photo I've got right here. Okay, so obviously we know that looks like Tariq. Tariq's working on a turbine generator. So obviously we know we have uh, rotation in our turbine. Okay, I've always been amazed in going in generating stations. And you guys, I mean, if you're looking for jobs, these are great jobs also in generating stations. Uh, how much do you think that turbine costs? A couple million. Million. That's right. Yeah, you, depending on the size of the generator you turn in there, anywhere between two and four million dollars just for the turbine. Okay, so obviously we have rotation there in the turbine. Let's see what time we're holding. 10 17. Yeah, 17. Okay, I'll go for three more minutes. Where's my YouTube? Right, we're done with that one. I uh, didn't mean to hit that. Okay, substation. So I'm just going to bring it up here. A C sine wave. And I want one with the degrees in it. There you go. All right, so you see by the photo over here, this one doesn't show the degrees, but it does show. voltage on the side. So they're showing one sine wave that goes up to a voltage and I would probably assume that would be 480 volts which uses a distribution voltage all along the path. Right here at the zero point, obviously how much voltage is being produced? None. None. All through the path, sorry about that. All through the path, once it leaves zero, the voltage is being produced. So you're gonna go, 100, 200, 300, 400. It's going to peak up here at 480. Then it's going to decline, you know, 400, 
300, 200, back down to zero. Once it goes to the negative side, it is still producing voltage. Don't get confused by that, 200, 300, 400 until it reaches 480 at the peak negative side. All right, how many times does this happen per second for electric utilities in the United States? 60 times a second. 60 times per second or 60 hertz. How many times in one waveform, one sine wave, are we at zero voltage? Three. One, two, and three. Okay, are we holding 1020 yet? I wanted to get a nice round number. It's close enough. All right, let's take about 10. We'll be back here at 1030. Okay, so you see in the diagram that I have up here, yep. it's a diagram of a simple generator. I'm still sharing, correct? Yep. Okay. It's a diagram of a, of a simple uh, AC generator and you see a rotation. All right, so first things we're gonna need here are uh, to be able to generate electricity are one, movement, and two, electric, electric uh, excuse me, a magnetic field to be able to create electricity. What component, we're not transforming here, we're in creation, correct? So transformation is a different thing, All right? We needed voltage applied as far as transformation and we needed induction. In generation, all we need is a magnetic field and movement. And once those two are produced, once I start spinning this uh, loop of wire right here in a magnetic field, voltage is produced. Now you notice there's two different sides. There's a red side and a blue side. And the magnetic field here is a north and a south. This directly relates to the sine wave that we're looking at. So you have a rise and a fall as this rotates and it goes through the full, when it does 360 complete degrees, you're gonna get a full positive voltage and a full negative voltage. So this directly relates, excuse me, where was my sine wave? To the AC sine wave that you're going here as far as one single rotation. So you can attribute the rotation of that AC generator in degrees. Obviously when it's at neutral, it's at zero degrees starting 90 degrees at peak here, 180 degrees, it's done a full circle rotation back at zero, 270 degrees, <coughs> negative, and one complete rotation is 360 degrees. So how many degrees are there in one full rotation of a generator? 360. 360 total, okay? That's how it directly relates to the uh, sine wave as far as generation is concerned. So you can watch this video. We're not gonna watch all of it. They don't use giant batteries. They do that by spinning a giant turbine like this. And to spin such a turbine, some power stations use very hot steam that blows over the turbines and spins it. Or maybe we can use the energy of the falling water. Or another example could be, we fit these inside giant windmills and let the wind do the work for us. Whichever way you choose, all we do is spin a giant turbine. But how does turning something create electricity? Well, the technology is based on electromagnetic induction, discovered by Michael Faraday more than 200 years ago. The basic idea is that if you take a wire and move it up or down inside a magnetic field, it induces an electric current. So all we have to do is attach a coil of wire to these giant turbines and place them inside a magnetic field. As the turbine rotates, the coil starts rotating and the wires start moving up and down inside the magnetic field that produces the electric current. 
and this can now be used to light up things. These devices are called electric generators. They convert spinning or mechanical energy. I kind of like, keep an eye on the light bulb. And the wires start moving up and down inside the magnetic field that produces the electric current. And this can now be used to light up things. You see how that uh, light bulb is going bright, dark, bright, dark, bright, dark? Hmm. Why, is yes. that Why is that happening? AC current. AC current hits zero three times per cycle. And they, they illustrate that well here. Now to the naked human eye and at 60 cycles per second, we can't see it with a naked eye. But it does happen, and that's a good illustration of that. Okay, so a, a moment ago, I think somebody said out there, well, what's inside a generator? How do we generate electricity? Now, I like to give this information. It's a little bit more in-depth. Can I make an electric generator? This is the outside portion of the generator. There's a core that spins inside of this thing. Can I make this out of magnets? Has anybody ever seen a magnet that big? No. No, it wouldn't be cost effective. So what they do in generating stations, if they, what they'll do is they'll introduce what they call an exciter current. They'll actually put current through this outer core. And once current goes through it, it creates a magnetic field. Then the inner core is going to spin. It's like the old, you see the size of this thing. Look, here's the guy over here. This, this, if you want to give it a comparison, and I heard this out there in the world, it takes money to make money, right? Yeah. Everybody heard that term before? Yeah. yeah, it takes electricity to make electricity in a generating station. You're going to have to have some kind of electric source to put a current through the outer core to create a magnetic field then spin the inner turbine, which has got another bunch of three sets of coils on it to be able to produce electricity. It's called, and you cannot do this at a generating station, it's called a term black start. You cannot black start a, gener a generator. If I turn the turbine inside here, it's turning the coils, I have no exciter current or current flow of the outer coils, nothing's gonna come out because I have no magnetic field. Does that make sense to everybody? Mm -hmm. Got to have current going through this first. So I'm gonna to have to have electricity in the generating station before I can even start generating. Okay, so we have talked thus far when you saw this diagram and you saw that uh, video you just saw here, we've been talking about single phase, one phase of primary <laughs> conductor or secondary conductor coming out of our generator. See one wire in, one wire out. What do we do in the case of where we need three phase power? Let's open this up. Open image and new page. And uh, where'd I go? There you go. All right, so now how do I produce three different phases of power or electricity? Uh, meter. Uh, what up? Add a neutral. Well, the neutral is going to be there, and Both the zero the line is actually going to be neutral. But how many sets of coils now do I have in the outer core? Three sets of coils in the outer Three core. Three sets instead of one, right? At one time, the previous pictures you saw, I only had a one north and one south. Now for A phase, I've got one north, one south. For B phase, I've got one north, one south. And for C phase, I have one north and one south, correct? Mm -hmm. I'm actually able to produce inside my generator three different phases of power. Now, vitally important, pay close attention here, please. On my waveforms that they're showing over here on the little, the dots that are going by, are any two phases at their peak or valley at the same time? Are they at their positive peak or negative peak at the same time? 
No. No, no none of them are. No. Obviously, my magnetic field is coming off the north-south of this inner portion right here cannot be at the peak because these are in different positions, correct? Yes. Okay. So that's obvious. I cannot peak all at the same time. I'm going to throw you something simple here. How do I know then if I need to measure from this phase to this phase? And we'll use for uh, demonstration purposes. Let me run over to paint so we can write this down. File, new, do not save it. So I'm going to draw a neutral line. Here's one phase of conductor, we will call it A. One phase of conductor, we will call it B. And one phase of conductor, we will call it C. Now I'm going to apply some voltages to it, 7,200. 7,200, 7,200. Let's do a little refresher here. How, what am I gonna use to measure the voltages between these points? Multimeter. Easy, 7,200 volts. Mm -hmm. Divide. No, oh, not a multimeter. What tool am I gonna use? Oh. Measure between these primary voltage phases. Remember what that was, the two old guys? That uh, stick. Phase. Phase. Okay. All right. I've got 7,200 volts here and 7,200 volts here. Remember our generator output None of the sine waves were peaking positive or negative at the same time. I attach one stick here and I attach another stick here. What should the voltage be? Let me ask you this, just true or false. Is the voltage gonna be 14,400? No. No. Obviously, we, we can't. Our sine wave and our generator won't allow it. Write this in a book, put it on your phone, keep it in your memory in your head all the time. There's a simple calculation that's been done. The math that's in it is extreme. You're going to have to know the degree of turn. You're going to have to know the voltage, peak, valley. It's, uh, it's all kind of stuff. But it's just crunched down to one number. Multiply by 1.7325. That's all you're gonna have to do to find out what your phase to phase, A to B, B to C, or A to C voltage is. 7,200 times 1.7325 equals 124700. 12,400, no, that's wrong. Too many zeros, 12,470. Everybody got that? This is vitally important now into, into the future for safety reasons, for test reasons, for actual on-the-job use. Any voltage that you have, and you have multiple phases, either two or three, the voltage between the two is going to be times 1.7325. So let's do a little primer right here. I've got a 120 voltage on A, and I've got a 120 voltage on B. What is it phase to phase? Two different phases. 120 times what? 1.7325. 207.9. You can round that. 208. 208. Okay. All right. Good to go. Any questions there? I know we jumped into three phase rather quick away from generation, but you're going to see this number a lot when we're using two separate phases. Okay. 
All right, so stand by for me for just a second. Crunching a lot into your brains today. <clears throat> Best there be anything you'd like to add that we've gone through so far? I'm, I'm jumping back to the quiz. Only thing I want to add to that is that that magic number, that 1.7325, you guys are going to see that again a lot. So just keep that in your brain or make a, make a note of it somewhere. You can get, refer back to it all, very mm -hmm. easy. So let me look at this thing. Uh, uh, Professor V, is that only used uh, when you're uh, measuring with the phasing stick? Say it, say that one more time. Is that only used when you're measuring with the phasing stick? No, that's gonna be on your secondary side of your transformers as well. That's why that's why I use that 120 voltage. Yeah. And uh, hold on one second. I know this might be getting away from the quiz, but it's gonna definitely be coming up. <clears throat> so many degrees, what degrees of voltage, their peak, how many cycles, one cycle, the load. Okay, I need to talk about that. Three times capacitor between per inductive capacitors, power, motor horsepower. Okay, that, 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 and that. Okay. So, let me go on to uh, paint and start new here. Oh, uh, yeah. don't say. We'll just discuss this part and we'll we'll probably change the test around V and give this later on. Yeah. But seeing how he asked the question, it, it's a good time to go ahead and okay. do this. And we, we were talking on the same scope. Okay. So I'm going to draw a transformer by its windings. <coughs> You sharing your screen? I'm not yet. I'm still drawing. Thank oh. you. For, thank you for the reminder. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Where's my mouse? I lost my mouse. <clears throat> you got that? Got it. Okay. Cool. All right, so we're looking here at a what they call a single phase transformer. Okay, now I'm going to draw a three phase transformer. I try to simplify this a little bit. This will come along later. Okay, so how many primary phases, this is the primary windings on top, secondary on bottom. How many primary windings do I have in this first diagram? One. One. Okay. That is considered single phase. Okay, how many windings do I have on this side? Three. Three, so that is three phase. Now you can make three phase secondary off of two primary phases. We'll discuss that later. So I'm using three phases here. All right, for simplicity's sake, I've got a neutral. I'm gonna have 120, 120, okay? I'm gonna not have, I'm gonna have a neutral in this case here, here, and here, I've gotta have a neutral. I'm gonna have 120. 120 and 120. Okay, these are all grounded. One, two, and three are grounded. 7,200, 7,200 this side, 7,200 this side. All right, in our normal typical situation, I'm gonna be working on the left-hand side first. My 120 and 120 voltage in single phase equals how much? Two forty. Okay, in single phase equals two forty. That is correct. 
Now I have introduced, and we just learned this in the generation part and the diagram that you saw. Now I've introduced three different phases in the electrical system. I know I've said this multiple times before. Whatever you do in the beginning is going to happen at the end. If I raise my voltage at a generating station, does the voltage gonna raise at my house? No. Yeah. Whatever happens at the front happens at the end. Okay. So if I had a 115 kV line and I raise that up to 130,000 volts, it's going to have an effect on the voltage I get at my house. Okay. It's just the properties of electricity. All right. We talked in the generation part, and I'm just going to do sine waves. This one's like this. This one's like this. This one's like this, and I'll draw the uh, zero line through here. Zero's there, zero's there, zero's there. That's the process of generation. No three are peaking at the same time. So here's the simple solution. I've got 7,200 volts. What is it times 1.7325? 1 12,470, correct? I used my magic number again. So from here to here, 12,470. From here to this phase, 12,474. From here's phase, 12,470. 12, Is that a question I heard? It's 12,474. We round to 12,470. Okay. Okay. Round down. Four, four volts is not gonna really make an effect on us right here. Is that same effect true for the secondary side? If it's happening on the primary side, bang, 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 what is my phase to phase voltage going to be on the secondary side? Same. What's the voltage? 360. 360. No, phase oh. to phase. I'll let you guys do the math. 208. 208. Excellent. Phase again to this phase. Same thing. 208. This phase to this phase. 208, okay? That's because I introduced three primary voltages that cannot peak or valley at the same time, here, here, or here. And really it stems all the way back to the generation product process. So, that, that's, so the voltage, we... that's a voltage output I'm gonna get between here and here, here, and here, and here, and here. 208. So were, we were we timing the 120 by the uh, 1.732? Excellent. Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Excellent. That's gotcha. why that's why that number is so important. Gotcha. And the previous question was, well, is it only 1.7325 phase to phase? Does that only happen in the primary? No. Once you introduce three a different phase, A, B. AC or BC, your output is going to have the same effect in a transformer. It's going to be 1.7325. All right, very important number. Okay, I'll give you another example here. You know the transmission lines that run beside the field and go down to that substation? The real big ones? Yeah. All right, when, when transmission crews and books, whatever you have out there, specify the voltage, they're always going to say the phase to phase voltage. And that line is at 115 kV. They always say that. So you know the highest potential voltage that you have there between the three phases. There's three wires. 
So between here and here, there's 115 kV. Between here and here, with a measurement, it's 115 kV. And from here all the way over to here, it's 115 kV. How much is it from the phase to earth ground? Would be 113. Mm -mm. I've given you the phase to phase measurement, which is a question mark times 1.7325. I'm looking for the question mark. To formulate the phase to phase, I've got to multiply by 1.7325. How do I find the phase to ground voltage? Really simple process here, 115 kV divided by 1.7325. What's your solution on that? 66,378. 66,38 is what they call it. Sometimes the company will go to 66.4 just to show it. So there's not actually, when I say that's a 115 kV line, there's not 115 on each conductor. There's only 66,380 on each conductor. But they'll always say in terminology, that's a 115 kV line or 230 kV, whatever the case may be. Let's do that one real quick. What's the phase to ground voltage of 230 kV? Phase to ground. 132,756. Excellent. You just took the divide, right? I'll take that as a yes. Okay. All right. Told you math would come in handy. All right. And that's simple math at that. So, where are we, Professor B, time wise? 1058. 1058. Okay. Let me look at something here real quick. No quiz today. I don't hear any hoorays or anything. <laughs> uh, hooray. 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 Yeah. Okay. So I do I like you a little bit. <laughs> So the next part V is we start getting into loads. So let me look at the quiz here real quick, make sure. Yeah, that's the rest of it. We're clicking and I need to unshare. I don't want to see it yet. Okay, don't give answers here. I'm just going to touch base on questions. So <clears throat> no quiz, but I'm just going to say this. How many times does one AC cycle produce zero volts? Uh, how many degrees are there in one full cycle gone over? At what degree are the voltage at their peaks gone over that? How many cycles are there in one second gone over that? In one cycle, voltage is being introduced all of the time. That's true or false. A load can be pre uh -huh. Let's talk about that. Then we start getting into the types of loads. Okay. We need to talk about one thing here. All right, so we have discussed many times, and I, this, is, this is a terminology thing, uh, load. Am I still sharing? Uh, not yet. Okay, hold on. Yes. Now, from the multiple times that I say it, can anybody tell me what I mean when I say load? It's the uh, amount of being used or put onto a system. It's the amount of what being used? Amount of power being used or a load put onto a generator or the, uh, the use. It's work. Okay. One person said work, one person said power. Uh, you're really very close to it and it's got the direct relation to, oh, hold on, load 
equals amps. Now, in, and I want to get this square in terminology because I know a lot of students are thinking, well, is it present? Is it not present? And it's going to come up in discussion. And this is a safety thing too. Professor V can attest to this is sometimes you're going to need to get some information on a circuit, either energized or de-energized of how much load is present on that circuit. Load refers to the amps either present or not present. Okay, so I'll, I'll do a simple diagram right here. I'm gonna put uh, a circuit breaker at a substation and just come out with one phase. It's come down here and it's gonna, I'm gonna have a 2000 horsepower motor. Okay, and that, then I got to have neutral and ground. Okay, when energized, all right, and we'll just put a simple 120 volts here. When energized in a complete circuit, and this is turning, load is present. And we're able to measure that load in what? Amps, okay? Load is present. This is the load, the motor. And when it's turning, when it's switched on, amps are flowing through it. So this is a load that is present, okay? It's running. Let's put a switch in here. Get my eraser. All right, and put my little O symbol. Okay, I've got my open switch there. Is load present? No. Oh. Is somebody saying no? Yeah, no. 100% correct, but it still exists. The reason why you're going to need to know this out here in the world is eventually you're going to have to close or open this switch, either open or close the switch. You need to know how much load is present on the circuit, right? If you open up too much load, you're going to have a huge arc that occurs. If that's the case, you know that the load is either present or not present out there. You might have to open the the breaker up it does that in a, an enclosed environment and you're not able to do that with a switch all right so in this case right here especially and professor v can attest i, I think our dispatchers helped out a good bit too mm -hmm. we came up to a switch and our dispatcher would let us know there is a lot of load that exists <laughs> on that circuit well, why did he tell me that? Why did the dispatcher give me a warning that there's a lot of load on this circuit? For your safety? Exactly. You're going to be closing a switch with a stick that's 10 feet long that has a very high amount of load that exists. It's not being fed yet. We haven't closed the switch, but he's gonna give you a heads up warning because of that. Now, let's put it back to normal. Let's close our switch back. He is gonna do the same thing in this situation. He's gonna say, there's a lot of load on that circuit. It is present right now. Why did he tell you that? Safety. And you're going to be opening that. You're going to open this switch. You're going to open this switch and it's going to draw a substantial arc when you do it. Okay. So that's when we're talking load. Current, we know what it is. Okay. It's the actual current that's flowing through the circuit. Each individual item on that circuit is a load. 
and it's either on by a closed switch or it's off by an open switch, you still need to know that it exists out there and it is present on your system. That's why they call it a load on your system. Does everybody understand that? So a load can be either energized or de-energized. I'm gonna show you one, show you one more video here and we'll try to wrap up. Uh, so let's go over. Lost my mouse again. So YouTube. And I'm gonna go back. Now guys, when you open and close switches with load on them, depending on the amount of load that's on them, remember the heat generated by that is as hot as the sun. Uh, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in depth once you see the video. Uh, utility, open switch, arc. Great example right here. was cool. <laughs> okay, so these are switch openings right here. You'll see the arc stream that's going through the air. Is amperage still flowing from one side of the switch to the other? No. Well, the open and close. Yeah, yeah, it is. Is electricity voltage still traveling from one side of that open blade to the other? Yes. Yeah. Yes, it is. Air is your new conductor, gentlemen. The air, oxygen, whatever's mixed with it, is now your new conductor. And it's flowing through that arc to the other side until it gets extinguished. Remember, you're close to this. It is very, very hot. And if this is my new conductor, it could actually blow into another phase and be a phase-to-phase -phase fault. Or it can blow down to the steel and arc over to the steel. That's a phase-to-ground fault. So that is an attempt. It's a failed attempt to break the amount of load that's on the system. It's breaking current. pretty substantial. Wow. Hold on to that one. Pick up the slow motion. Can you guys hear the sound pretty well? Mm -hmm. Okay, hold on. I'm going to do slow mo on this one. Watch this. Normal, let's do it half speed. Okay, so this arc starts between all three phases. You hear that distinctive roaring sound. All right, you see what happened right there at the end? You heard that big snap at the end? That was actually a phase to phase fault. One of the arc streams touched the other arc stream and operated the breaker. The breaker opened up. See, when you heard that big snap, <clears throat> that was the actual fault occurring. There it goes. I'll go back to normal state. Oh, 
That was pretty cool. O perfeito vídeo. There's another fault. You heard that big explosion at the end. Are you okay? You okay? <laughs> yeah, I just need to clean up my drawers. Okay. All right. Any questions there? As far as load, electrical arcs are concerned, we'll get more into those later. Uh, let me stop this share here. Okay, good good day today. A uh, lot of technical information going on today. And remember, I, I know through these processes right here, well, do I really need to know this to be alignment out there in the world? And the answer is going to be what? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Not only do I want to get you the construction part, down and be able to do line work out there in the field as far as you know climbing poles and digging ditches and all that good stuff i mean you're going to get pre-tested to go into and really this is going to come up uh he's on the phone right now you know that uh almost all of your organizations here have a probationary period right santi cooper's got a six month probationary period in it and uh you're going to get tested you're gonna, well, what does a transformer do? How does a transformer work? How do you get 240 out of a transformer? How do you measure phase to phase voltages? What should that voltage be? So, you know, not only do I want you to get the job, I want you to keep it. Yeah. Too. Okay. I, I mean, that, I, I don't know. My day, I stepped onto the job and I'll just give you the short story here. Uh, a guy saw me working on my car in my yard and he said, and he referred me to Santy Cooper. And the next day I drove down there, uh, just came straight off the beach with my surfboard, no shirt and sandals on. And the guy asked me, do you know how to use a shovel? I said, yes. And I was hired the next day. Okay. Now, that's 1979. Today they're, they're going to, they're going to farm you. They're going to cull some questions out of you. I didn't have a probationary period, but now they do. Do does Duke? Exactly. It's um. I think it's a six month probationary period as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you know, there's there's some things you need to satisfy in that period. One, uh, <clears throat> looking at you in the field, they're gonna do the construction part. Two, they're gonna do some in classroom learning and testing. Okay, that's what we're going through right now. Uh, Make sure you got your CDL within that six month period. If you don't have the full CDL A license, they'll help you with that too. So a lot happens in that six month period. I have had some students graduate, didn't make it six months and usually it was a CDL uh -huh. that, that got them out there. Uh, and how much do I expect you to remember? What, six months from now? Say you get out of class here, you graduate, you got a certificate, so we're going to say about, what, two, three more months on that. How much do I expect you to remember? 100% of what we said today? No. No, I don't have that expectation. But I do, and here's the, the simple part about it. These YouTubes will be on here forever. We have a phone. You're going to be on Remind. 
and we're, you just refer back to what you've already got as far as, they're asking me on three phase, what's 7,200 and 7,200? Shoemaker said something about a magic number. I remember that part. I just can't remember what it was. Mm -hmm. At least you got the direction to go to find out what your answer is going to be, okay? Obviously, if I had a photographic memory, I'd be, well, I'd be at MIT or something like that, but mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm just a simple lineman. All right, any questions that are out there today? Okay, once again, no quiz. I will let you know the next quiz is gonna be about 20 questions all in one quiz. Uh, that'll happen Monday? Monday. Yeah, Monday after lecture on Monday. Tomorrow, <laughs> unless, unless tomorrow gets rained out. So if we get rained out tomorrow, we'll be watching the radar close. If we're in the field tomorrow, the quiz will be Monday evening or Monday afternoon. If we get rained out tomorrow, we're gonna to be in Zoom and you're gonna get the quiz tomorrow afternoon. Make sense to everybody? All right. Yeah. Professor V, anything you'd like to add? No. Well, one thing I was just thinking right there when you're talking about your probation period, guys, um, then the reason, one of the reasons why they do all, they go that route is because it, you know, they're thinking a lot of time and money in you to be a good employee and they just want to make sure that you're fit for the job as well. So just wanted to add that little bit in. Yeah. Think of the process. If I hired a guy off the street, that's why you guys are so popular yep. nowadays. If I had to hire a guy off the street, yeah. and I, I've got a, six months is not really that long. No, I can really tell you got six months and you got to be working too. I mean, you're going to have to be out in the field. They want you on the job. One thing I Santa Cooper uh, did the calcula calculation on this. If I took a guy off the street and trained him to be able to make his probationary period good, it would cost about $50,000, right? You walking into the company, and this is no another thing of your popularity is, I don't need to train him as heavily. He knows the basics. Mm -hmm. So he's going to get that scrunched in there. Two is you're going to be able to step into a CPR and a, a uh, what do you call it? First aid, CPR. first aid class, which should last for one day. And the next day you're on the job working. Yeah. Not in a classroom with the company. And that's where they get the money savings from. Right. So, uh, yeah, it, it's vital that that probationary period, at least, you know, the basics. And these are the basics that you're going to get here in the class. Okay. Any other comments, questions, concerns? Hearing none, gentlemen, have a good day.